All right, Darian Townsend, welcome to the podcast, man. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. Thanks for having me, Brad. Very excited. Yeah. Um, so listen, we were just chatting a second off here. What are you up to right now? What's going on? Yeah, so uh, I work for a YMCA. Uh, the club I coach, uh, the Westside Solfins, is a YMCA team uh, here in Phoenix. Uh, so obviously with, with everything going on, the, the swim team is not practicing at the moment. Uh, but our YMCAs have stayed open and, and we stayed open for uh, emergency child watch. And so what that is, is uh, we stayed open to look after first responders uh, and uh, essential workers, uh, children, you know, they have to go into work. Um, and so they need a place to, to put their kids for the day. And so we are uh, looking after the kids, detaining them, making sure they're safe, feeding them, um, even educating them with some of the homework packets they've been given. And so um, myself and the other full-time worker, my head age group coach, uh, David Dudati, uh, we look after kids all day and, and basically just uh, uh, work at the Y uh, pretty much all day and, and have fun with these kids. Wow, that's super impressive, man. It's one of those aspects of all this that you don't really hear about. So super impressive, man. How, yeah, thank uh, you. That's crazy. Yeah, it's definitely uh, given me a, a new perspective on, on some of the other jobs that, you know, the YMCA has. Um, you know, obviously being in swimming, I pretty much just live out in the pool all day, but uh, there are people inside that do this for a living and um, it's a lot of fun. The kids are great fun, um, but it, it is some, it's some long days, but it's, uh, it's good work that we're doing. So how many hours a day and then what are the ages that you're dealing with? Um, so I work, my schedule is 6.30 to 3.30 every day. Uh, we look after the kids. Uh, my age group is 10 through 12 years old and I have anywhere between 10 and 15 each day that I'm looking after. Wow, that's amazing. Now, uh, do you do you have to wear any sort of protection when you're with them or anything like that? Um, no, it's up to you. It's a personal preference. Um, if you're if you're working the front desk, uh, we've been asked to wear uh, s some masks. Um, you know, interacting with the parents and people coming in with inquiries as to whether we open and um, you know checking out their accounts and things like that. But in terms of working with the kids, it's personal preference. I'm not, um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of up to you. Wow. Is, is it hard to fill up the day with a bunch of activities? Um, it's, it's challenging, you know, um, writing some practices comes naturally to me. I can whip one up in a couple minutes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, finding activities that the, the kids enjoy doing is a little more challenging. I think I'm getting better at it. Uh, for example, today we, uh, we made, uh, animals out of paper plates. We got some crayons and <laughs> cut out some, some ears and noses and things like that. And we stuck them on and we made uh, paper plate animals. So little things like that just passes the time. And one of the things I'm really trying to do from every exercise we do, uh, no matter how simple or, you know, it is, is I'm trying to teach the kids a message. Um, you know, so today we had make pan uh, animal paper plates and then stand up in front of the class and, and say something about your animal, its name, what it is, uh, and something fun, you know, a fun fact about it. And, so you, you're getting the kids standing up in front of an audience now. And so public speaking comes into mind. And so, um, you know, trying to teach them something from these little activities we're doing. Well, listen, man, I got a, a text message from a good friend of mine, Mike Lewis, who's a photographer and he's a good friend of yours as well. And, and he texts me, he's like, you've got to get Darian on the, uh, on the podcast. And uh, <laughs> he, he's just said, he's one of the best people that you'll ever meet. And uh, mean, even within the first few minutes, just what you're doing here is, very very impressive man well thank you i appreciate that yeah it's a uh, mike's a great guy um you know my, my wife and i um you know claire and i have known him for quite a few years now and just a super down-to-earth guy and, and really good at what he does with his photography but more importantly um just the respect he has for for the swimmers he works with on a, on a daily basis is just unbelievable so yeah really good guy but i, I appreciate those kind words thank you yeah, a lot of good people in our sport. And that's kind of why I started this podcast in the first place is just to highlight some people. And, and I try not to necessarily uh, pick people that um, everybody knows, you know, it's, uh, I mean, you, you are certainly somebody that is well known within the swimming community. But uh, I think sometimes we, we spend a lot of time on the stars. And um, there are a lot of people in this sport doing a lot of great things. And you're certainly one of them. So um, really impressive, man. Um, awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, keep it up. So, so let's just get into your story a little bit. Uh, you know, you've come a long way, and, and you've and you, you've done a lot a lot of things. Obviously, you know, grew up in South Africa. So, how did you initially get into swimming in the first place? 
Yeah, so yeah, I grew up in South Africa, was born there. Um, both my parents swam. Uh, they're both swimmers. They still swim to this day. They do a lot of open water swims in South Africa. Uh, but they both uh, grew up swimming competitively for uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, they moved down to South Africa and started a family there. And uh, my sister and I were born. Uh, but my mom's trade is, is swim lessons. She teaches people to swim um, all the way through to about, you know, sometimes seven, eight years old. Um, if they're ready for clubs, she sends them off to the club level. Uh, but that's her trade. Um, she owns a certain swim school there. So swimming is... Is, is a family thing that we do. Uh, my sister also swam all the way through college. She attended uh, TCU there in Fort Worth. Um, so yeah, we're a swimming family and um, it's the one sport that was constant through all of my growing up in South Africa. I played a bunch of different sports, um, sports that you will know very well, maybe, maybe America doesn't, uh, but cricket and rugby and field hockey and, and sports like that. Uh, but swimming was the one sport that I did all the way from when I was really young um, until I decided in high school that this is what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to use swimming to to see the world, uh, to get my education. And and here I am now passing my knowledge on to, you know, the next stars uh, that are coming up. Yeah. I, I've never been to South Africa. It's a really crazy thing to say. Um, there was a couple of opportunities in my swimming career where there was some I think they had some World Cups there or something. What, what were the things they were doing in South Africa at the time? Yeah, so back in, um, I believe it was 2001, they, they experimented with a, uh, like a sprint series there. They, they invited a bunch of uh, international stars to come out um, and they experimented with that. And then when the World Cups really kind of kicked on, uh, I think from about 2003 onwards, they hosted one every year all the way through, um, I want to say 2009. Uh, they were part of the World Cup series, uh, one of the stops for that series. And um, mm. yeah, so it, it was great for the country. We got to see some really fa uh, fast swimming and um, a lot of world records broken at those World Cups. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful place. It really is. Um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time there growing up. And, um, you know, I could see myself living there one day too. Um, it really is a great place. I still have family there. Um, and so uh, I think... I think a lot of the good things come out of South Africa. I know a lot of good sportsmen come out of South Africa. Um, we all, a lot of us end up somewhere else in the world, um, but uh, the, the talent level, the talent pool, that, the gene pool that we have there is amazing when it comes to sport. Yeah, a lot of great sports people come out of South Africa. I, I, mean, I mean, to be fair to Australia, a lot of better ones come out of Australia, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. There's, just, there's always been this little rivalry course, between yeah, yeah, South Africa <laughs> and Australia, but it's kind of like Australia and New Zealand, you know, we just jab at each other. I'm not sure yeah. why, just the Commonwealth countries really get after each other. But, um, but no, there's, there's obviously a tremendous amount of respect for the sports uh, stars that come out of South Africa, especially, like you said, rugby is huge in Australia mm -hmm. and South Africa. Cricket is very big. Um, you know, I remember sitting at home watching the World Cup, uh, the Rugby World Cup, uh, and, and watching Nelson Mandela. And, and, and I believe South Africa won that year, did they not? Yeah, 95. Yeah, our first, um, our first couple of years out of isolation after apartheid. And, um, yeah, we ended up winning that one. And that's really the uh, – that, that, I mean, that World Cup, when you talk about people my age and anywhere around my age that were, were old enough to know what was going on, I mean, that's a huge part of uh, South African history. Um, for mm -hmm. us coming out of apartheid and, uh, you know, coming into our first uh, really tournament when it comes to sports and we ended up winning that one. And yeah. um, just, I mean, I know that played a huge role in what I wanted to do with my life. I, I knew I wanted to be involved in sport and it really, um, looking back on it, I mean, it just gave me that motivation to know that we're a small country. I, I, was, I grew up in a, in a very small city. Um, but I could do something with sports and I could be someone with sports. So uh, very, something very dear to my heart. Yeah, it's a fascinating country. I've always been fascinated with it. And for whatever reason, I could just never get there. But I always wanted to go. There are so many great things that come out of it and great stories that come out of it and and just the fascination that i have with history and and the, uh, the whole apartheid and and everything that goes along with the country itself uh is very very fascinating to me but so so give us an insight like what was it like to grow up i mean we the impression that i get and, and correct me if i'm wrong but the impression that i get is that um the majority of white people that grow up there are very privileged is that is that wrong to think that did you grow up I think in a for a long household? time? I think for a long time that that was the way it was. Um, I think things have changed now with with it being equal 
through all the different races that we have. Um, but yeah, that, that was essentially what it was like. Um, you know, the white people held the power in the country and, and really held the, the high powered jobs um, and, and obviously earned more income that way. But now with, um, with equal rights, I think it's, it's definitely shifted a little bit and um, it's not so much, you know, that the whites have, have all the, uh, the wealth now, it's definitely shared among all the different races a little bit more. Did you get a feeling that you were privileged growing up or did you never get that sense? Um, I think I had a sense. I, I don't, you know, I was about, um, you know, I, I was pretty young during, during the, everything that was going on. So I didn't really know what was going on too much, but, um, I think I got a sense and obviously you're, you're driving around and, and a lot of, basically you saw a, a lot of non-white people using public transport, um, mm -hmm. instead of owning their own cars, for example. And so I think you, I look back on it now and it, it makes more sense to me now that that's, that's why it was that way. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, you're just, you're just kind of going with the flow and you don't know too much different. Yeah. So you had, you, you, one of your coaches in South Africa was a very famous man, Graham Hill, right? Uh, he was, what part of your childhood did he coach, coach you? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a different city from where Graham was, but my dad and Graham actually knew each other for a very long time. Uh, they swam against each other growing up, and they also played a lot of water polo against each other. So I, I always knew Graham from a very young age. I, I swam at a club in Peter Marisburg uh, called Seals, um, and it was coached by Wayne Ridden. And he was my coach really from when I was seven years old, when I joined the club, all the way through to about 18 years old, um, when I was still in high school. Okay. Um, and uh, he really coached me and brought me up, taught me a lot of the stuff that I know and, and use today when I coach. Mm. Um, very, very uh, good with technique. Um, and so we got along very, very well. Um, I spent a year between high school and the 2004 trials. I decided to, to spend a year uh, training for the trials and, and kind of defer my starting um, you know, college in the US here for a year. Um, just to focus on making the Olympics. Um, and that's when I made the switch to Graham. Um, I just left high school. I, I was really looking for more competition. Um, the club that I was at didn't have um, the guys my, my age really for me to train with, whereas Graham's squad really had an abundance of those guys. And so I switched for about four or five months to train with Graham, uh, ended up qualifying for, 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 uh, for Athens. And he coached me all the way through uh, the Athens Olympic Games. So. Uh, Graham's a great coach. He's he's coached some fantastic swimmers over the year over the years. Uh, you know, Terence Parkin, mm. he was before me. Uh, he was actually my training uh, training partner. He ended up winning a, a silver medal in the Sydney Olympics mm -hmm. in the two hundred breaststroke. And then uh, more recently, Chad Vaclo, who's had a lot of success, um, obviously on the international stage. Um, and so Graham's really coached some great swimmers. Um, I think Graham, one of his biggest strengths is just relating to the swimmers. Um, mm. His training is, is good and he has the squad for it, but I think the way he relates to the swimmers and is able to motivate them through, through conversations, I think is one of his, uh, his great skills he possesses. Yeah, and it's, it's great that you've had a couple of great coaches in your life and even your parents have had an influence on, on your coaching uh, and your swimming because you, you learn from different people, right? You take the best of what you, what you hope to take from them and try and leave maybe the things that you didn't love, but ultimately you, they do influence you in a, in a in a very impactful way and so you've obviously had some great coaches growing up yeah yeah i mean i look at all the people that i've worked with and um i wouldn't obviously like you said you take certain things you leave certain things but they've all left a mark on me they've all uh, influenced me in a certain way and i use that every single day now not not just in swimming but in, in life too you know the life mm. lessons i've learned from from swimming i'm applying to the kids i'm teaching right now so um yeah i think Every opportunity is, is a learning opportunity, uh, no matter whether it's good or bad, you, you've got to learn from it. And um, I think, yeah, I think it's spot on there. What's something that you could take from growing up in South Africa that you think you can attribute to who you are today? I think, um, you know, I, I read, you know, once one simple thing that comes to mind is the, the facilities in South Africa um, compared to what we have here in the U S you know, I look out my office here and we've got a, a 50 meter pool out here um, that's, you know, state of the art when it comes to, to training. Mm -hmm. uh, in South Africa, we didn't have that. Um, I'm not saying we didn't have a pool to train in and we didn't have lane lines and things like that, but conditions are not, are not ideal in South Africa when it comes to training. And a lot of swim clubs there uh, really struggle to, struggle to find water and space and, and 
water that's clear and doesn't turn green um, overnight sometimes, you know. So I think growing up like that, you really come to appreciate what you have in this country when it comes to the conditions and the facilities. So um, at the end of the day, it's as simple as having a pool. If you have a pool, um, you're able to train, you're able to get better at, at something that you love. So I think growing up in South Africa, that really taught me that I don't need perfect conditions to be able to do what I need to do. So you hadn't come to America before the 2004 Olympics? When, when I had. You? I'd come over ac across yeah. twice. I did a uh, tour in high school with, with my club, Seals and Wayne. Uh, we toured around Florida and did a couple meets there. Um, I think, actually think we trained at the, the old um, Hall of Fame swimming pool there in Orlando. Okay. Um, or Fort Lauderdale, sorry, I should say. Um, so we trained there for a couple weeks and, and did some touring, uh, Disney World, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I come across once before in 2004 um, for the World Cup in New York. I came okay. across and um, competed in that. So I've been across twice before I started uh, my collegiate career in 2004. So I read your bio and, and there's a lot of kind of 200 IM success and there's some 200 free and, and some other events. But the 100 freestyle doesn't jump off the page necessarily. So how did you tell us the story of how you ended up on this four by one relay that ends up winning the gold medal and um, taking the world by surprise in 2004? Yeah, so um, really from about 2000 um, was when I really started applying myself to wanting to be the best I could be in swimming. I wanted to be the best from 2000 Olympics uh, after watching that on, on television. Um, that's when I started to okay, let, let's start to work towards something here. And uh, it took me a couple seasons. Um, I, I expected immediate success. You know, when I started to train hard, I was like, hey, why am I not getting faster? Um, but it took me a couple seasons to realize that, um, you know, I've got to work hard every single day. Um, and I did that. I, I got some international exposure by doing a couple of tours overseas. I did the, the Mara Nostrum. The Mara Nostrum for me was really the biggest eye opener. I did mm. For the first time in 2002, I, I went across and did the Mara Nostrum, and um, I thought I was I thought I was good before I left for the Mara Nostrum. I got to the Mara Nostrum. Um, we, we swam in uh, Spain, we swam in, in France, and in Monaco, um, and I just I mean I got my butt kicked there essentially, um, and that wasn't just in the swimming pool in the competition. I got my butt kicked in warm ups. I mean I'd get into a lane and I'd have these these girls from some other countries, um, just literally something over the top of me. Um, and it really opened my eyes to, you know, how much tougher I needed to become as an athlete mentally and, and physically to, to qualify for the Olympics. Um, so I learned from that. I went back, I trained really hard. I had a French coach come across uh, and train with us for a couple months. Um, and I really learned a lot from him, uh, Fred Venu. Mm. Um, and I learned a lot from him, um, as, a, as to how to get better and how to train hard. Um, ended up qualifying for the 2003 uh, World Championships that were in Barcelona. And that was my first really senior South African tour uh, as part of the swim team. Um, I, was on the same, I was on the relay team with the boys um, that made the final. We ended up getting eighth in that final in Barcelona. Um, it was myself, Lyndon, Rake, and Roland. Uh, the same four that a year later would, would win gold in Athens. Wow. We ended up getting eighth year before in Barcelona and, and nowhere near a gold medal or a podium finish. I mean, eight by a long way. Mm. Um, and so I went back and worked hard, ended up um, qualifying for Athens in the 200 freestyle. Mm. Um, the 200 freestyle was always something my coach Wayne and, he, and, and um, eventually Graham and all the coaches said to me, that's going to be your best event. Yeah. And being the stubborn person that I, that I am and was, I just didn't believe it. So I, I wanted to be a 1500 freestyler. Um, and so I uh, ended up qualifying for the 200, but then also, you know, I think I ended up getting third in the 2004 trials and so qualifying for the relay. Um, and that's essentially how I got onto that relay in Athens was uh, through the trials and, you know, getting third at, at nationals. So you guys go from eighth the year before to, like I said, shocking the world. And it really was a shock. I mean, um, I think the prelims, you guys obviously had a good swim, but I still don't think people believe that you were going to win the final. And in the final, it was just a total blitz. I mean, you guys went from the get-go and never looked back. Um, what was the mindset leading up to that? How did that eventuate for you guys? 
Yeah, so I think we always knew that that Roland was going to be our leadoff guy. I mean, he was our fastest hundred freestyler um, as part of that relay team. Um, I don't think that we ever thought we'd have such a lead after the first leg. I mean, we, we obviously come into meet, everyone's confident. Uh, you don't know how fast you're going to swim, but I think it was a maybe not to Roland and maybe not to the, the people closest to him and his coaches at the time, but I don't think anyone thought that Roland would lead off as fast as he did. Mm. Um, and honestly, after that lead off and having that much distance between him and the next swimmer, it, it made life for the rest of us very easy on that relay team. We didn't need to do anything miraculous besides hold our nerve and, and go the times we knew we could go. Um, so really it was, it was Roland that, that, that helped us, uh, you know, obviously get that lead and then, you know, just do your job. Don't mess up basically after that. And what, what position did you go? I was third. Third, okay. So what are you yeah. thinking? What are you thinking as you're standing up on the blocks and you do have the lead? Um, I definitely nervous. My knees were definitely <laughs> shaking. Um, I think one of the things that helped me was, um, yeah, I'd have some international exposure before the 04 Olympics, but um, I really didn't know who a lot of people were. I mean, I didn't... I didn't have, you know, that, that burning. I didn't have the, 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 the nervousness to know like, hey, I'm racing someone who's won two Olympic gold medals, the, the Olympics before. I really just was kind of in my own head, um, making sure I did my own job. So, um, but yeah, to say I wasn't nervous on that, on that block was, uh, that's definitely not true. I was nervous. I think I was, I think for me, I was more nervous about letting my teammates down than I was about anything else. And I think that really helped me. Um, and I know those guys really helped me, you know, keep those nerves uh, calm before the event. Do you remember the race itself? Like, do you remember being in the water and, and swimming the event? I, I, I think I remember the prelims more than I remember the final. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the prelims, I, I went out way too hard on the first 50 in the prelims. Um, I think I was out 22.7 on my feet or 22.9 or something like that. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm a guy who was going out 23.5 normally uh, mm -hmm. and really kind of coming home um, a lot stronger with the 200 background. Um, but the, the morning swim stuck out more and I remember it more because the second 50, you know, you don't want to start hurting with 35 meters to go. I mean, that's not, that's not ideal. When that starts <laughs> to jump on your back with 35 to go, you know you've gone out too hard and then, then it's tough. Um, whereas in the final, I, I went out a little bit easier and really, the fatigue only came the last 15. Um, and so the prelims stuck out more because I knew I'd messed up a little bit, but I was still able to, to hold my nerve and finish. What do you think in the last 25 of that final race? Like, what is going through your head? Are you, are you speaking to yourself inside your head? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you're going through everything, hold the technique together, you know, focus on your breathing, that kind of stuff. But really, with, with 25 to go, I mean, you're swimming for those other three guys in your relay team. And in a the final there, you're swimming for your country. Um, and so I'm just, just telling myself, do my job. Uh, don't let them catch you. Just finish. Just you know, do what, you, what you've been training to do for many years. Um, but it, yeah, at that point, it's, you're on autopilot and you're just trying to get home as fast as you can. Yeah. Now, did the impact hit you straight away or did it take a while for you to realize you're Olympic champion? Um, I mean, I think, it, yeah, I would say it, it hit me. I didn't, I don't remember it because there's a, there's a picture of the three of us that are on the deck and rakers in the water. He's not in the shot, but there's a picture of Roland, myself and Lyndon. Lyndon's on the block flexing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a very famous picture. Yeah. Roland's to his one side, I'm to his other. And I, I'm a, pretty controlled guy i want to say in terms of my emotions but i'm screaming i have this face like you know i, I i'm screaming my arms are flexed um and i don't remember that at all uh yeah. so um i think it hit me i didn't remember it uh but then afterwards looking at it, it it's a pretty cool image um that obviously uh with a lot of emotion there and a lot of pride uh, came out in all of us yeah South Africa's had some success in, in swimming, uh, even before that, right? They did won gold medals before that one, haven't they? Yeah, we, we had some success over the years. Um, I know that uh, we've had a tradition of, of, of freestyle sprinters, 1500. We have had quite a, quite a rich tradition dating, uh, you know, all the way back to 1984. I think Peter Williams was our, was our first success in terms of producing um, a male in, in those events at the Olympic Games. Um, the success that comes to mind, um, 
growing up for me, uh, Penny Haynes, mm-hmm, Penny you know, 1996, the breaststrokes, uh, yeah. she swept both of those. Uh, yeah. That was when Amanda Beard was just coming on the scene yeah. uh, as a young uh, female breaststroker from the US. But I remember Penny Haynes being a huge role model for me. She was mm. also from an area close to where I grew up in South Africa. So, you know, that also was special for me. Um, and then uh, Terence Parkin, obviously mm-hmm. in 2000 in Sydney, getting a silver medal in the Tour breaststroke. Um, yeah, and then uh, just recently, obviously Chad and Cameron uh, having success. Uh, so yeah, we've for a small country, we do definitely produce quite a few uh, really good swimmers, and a lot of them have some have had some good success at the Olympic Games. Did your gold medal have an impact back home? You think? I mean, obviously with Chad later on, and and like you said. Um, a couple of other people that have come through South Africa obviously were influenced by your gold medal. Did you feel like that had an impact on them? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, I think uh, every time, a, 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 in, specifically in our case, you know, you have success as a country at, at such a huge event, it, it, it definitely um, brings back motivation uh, for those athletes growing up. And I think every single time we do that, um, I think those athletes back home realize, hey, these guys are just like us. They're maybe a little bit older than us, but they grew up in, in this country. They've done the work and they're having success on the, on the international stage. So um, I, I know that, uh, you know, throughout the years and at the time too, we've had an outpouring of people, you know, obviously wishing us well and congratulating us, but just thanking us for giving them the motivation to become the athlete that they want to be and they can be. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think the success is definitely there. Uh, Chad, I mean, I can remember Chad, and I was just actually speaking with someone back home about this. Um, the day we were, I was leaving Graham's um, swim club to, to go on our pre-Olympic camp and everything like that. I remember Chad's dad, Bert, who's also a very famous guy in South Africa, coming up to me and introducing Chad to me. And Chad must have been nine or ten years old at the time, maybe even younger, and, and introducing me to Chad and saying, hey, my boy is going to win Olympic gold one day. And oh, wow. um, <laughs> you hear that. I mean, as a yeah. swim coach, you know, you have parents coming in saying, oh, my, my kid's the next Michael Phelps or yeah. Kayla Decky. And mm-hmm. I, I was talking with someone about that. And um, Chad's parents is the only one who's made that statement to me over a lot of people that have said it that has actually come true. <laughs> you know, you look four years later, Chad's knocking on the door. And then eight years later, he's winning a gold medal. So yeah, uh, yeah. pretty, pretty special moment um, to think back on that. I'm glad we had one come through for us. That's good. <laughs> yeah, you get that a lot. I've, I've heard that a few times. Um, now, I, I text Roland uh, Schumann yesterday, and uh, I, I, I asked him, you know, what should I ask Darian? And the first thing he responded back was, ask him about the after party in Athens. So, <laughs> obviously, obviously, there's a story that goes with after winning the gold medal, but um, I can imagine because the after party for all of us in Athens was – was pretty spectacular it was a it was a fun place to be during the olympics right yeah yeah it was um yeah roland roland's funny he says that yeah he was my roommate uh, yeah. we were roommates t- together on a lot of the trips but um yeah in 2004 we were roommates and uh i have a i have a lot of respect for roland I, he's truly one of my my best friends um and uh he's, he's had so much success success in the sport and uh, even better, he's one of the nicest guys you'll speak to. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of success for Roland. And yeah. he, um, he's really helped me a lot in my career. You know, when I was making um, the transition, when I was making the transfer from University of Florida to, to Arizona and Tucson, he's really the guy that, 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 you know, reached out to me and said, hey, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome. And, you know, I stayed with him for a couple of years there and just he's done wonders for me. So truly grateful yeah. for, for a guy like that in my life. Yeah, yeah no, he was, did. Um, he did text me back and say, "Don't ask him that." By the way, but I still <laughs> asked you. <laughs> but no, he did say the same thing about you that you were roommates and and uh, you've grown a lot. And he's he's very proud to know you as a friend and um, and teammate. And he said very nice things about you, uh, uh, no doubt. But but yeah, we did have some fun in Athens. So I'll tell you a story. I was in a car. So Grant Hackett wins the fifteen hundred freestyle, and. Um, he does his drug test. He gets his gold medal. Within two hours of winning the gold medal, we were in, I was in a taxi. We got in a taxi and we were headed to – because the, the, the 1500 was on the last day, so the swimming's done. So we're like, all right, we're going to go to a party, right? So two hours after he wins the gold medal, we're in a taxi. It's myself. I'm in the front seat. And in the back seat, it's Grant Hackett, Michael Clem, and Ian Thorpe, all right? 
And so just the four of us and the taxi driver. And we were like, all right, we're headed to this place. So he takes off and apparently it's about 45 minutes away. I'm telling you, I swear we were on death's door the whole 45 minutes. This guy was driving like a maniac down the streets of Athens, Greece. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, oh, fantastic. I'm going to die in a taxi. And the only three people they're going to talk about are these three knuckleheads behind <laughs> me, these, these Olympic champions. This is, the, this is the worst place to die, right? <laughs> so uh, that, that, was my, that was my inside story on that one. But it was, it was, a, it was a lot of fun in Athens, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, obviously with, with myself having this success there, it's the one I, I look back on with the most fond memories. But um, just uh, there was a lot of freedom there, mm -hmm. I mean, in Athens. Maybe it was just the times and, and security has gotten more strict as, as the times have rolled on with, with the other Olympics. But Athens was really, it, there was freedom. I mean, mm -hmm. once you left the village, you could re pretty much do anything. Um, yeah. My parents and, and myself on that second week when we got to really explore Athens and, and watch the other sports, you know, we toured the islands. We, we took a big ferry out to one of the islands and then we rented scooters and we just drove around the island, which only took about 45 minutes to an hour. But we stopped at, at little restaurants and, and stopped at beaches and yeah. uh, we just had a ton of fun in Athens. And the people were, were unbelievable there. Uh, so friendly and inviting and just a, a really, really cool atmosphere, um, you know, at that Olympics. Yeah. Now, we actually got a chance to race each other. I don't know if you remember this, but 2006, we raced at the Commonwealth Games. It was my last uh, meet. And it was the first time that I actually ever made the Australian 4x1 freestyle relay team. I, uh, I swam for Australia for seven years, and all I ever did was the 50 free because I couldn't come back home. I, I, just, I only had one gear, and that was to go as fast as I possibly could and hold my breath and touch the wall at the other end. That was all I could do really well. Um, but for some reason, I ended up on this uh, relay team for Australia, and I believe uh, were you on that relay team in 2006? Yeah, so no, 2006 was, uh, that was interesting. I'll tell, I'll tell you my story about that. I, um, I, I was assuming, you know, I started here in college at University of Florida and I, I, I did my trials um, at your old university in Auburn there um, that December before. So in 2005, I had my own little Commonwealth trials at the US Open there. They allowed me to use that as qualifying. Okay. Um, I qualified for the relay. And then we obviously, we traveled down to, uh, to Melbourne there to, for the Commonwealth Games. And then I had to do a time trial um, to get on the relay, basically. Similar yeah. to what we did in Athens. We, we went to a, a pool a couple of days before the Athens um, you know, started the prelims. And we did a time trial and the top two would go through to, you know, to, to some of the prelims. And so we did something similar. And uh, Harold Zandberg, uh, who was, you know, he was training mm -hmm. in Arizona a couple of years later after that. He actually beat me. Time trial. I believe um, Brent Hayden actually swimmed in, in the time trial too, for, for whatever reason. Uh. So I actually didn't end, end up getting on that relay in 2006. He took my spots and um, oh. I think South Africa ended up winning it. Um, yeah, you don't have to mention that. They did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah so I never got right. to, to be on that. Yeah, that was the only time I, I was on the 4x1, and, and okay. South Africa did. They beat us just by a little bit. It was but, close. Uh, it, it, was yeah, it was close. close. I do remember that. Yeah, Yeah. so I was, I was on that one, but uh, I was one and done. But um, <laughs> So then you, how did you end up in Florida? How, what was the decision to come to America, and how did you end up at Florida? So, um, you know, in, in 2000, and, well, really in 2002, I should have started in 2003, but 2002, um, I got a little bit of, um, you know, uh, um, you know, people started reaching out to me from the States about, about mm -hmm. something here um, in college. And the University of Florida really reached out and, and, and did the best job of recruiting. I mean, they were, um, they were very respectful of my time. Um, and so I ended, up, I ended up taking a recruiting trip there. Um, and at the same time, I think I went out to, to Auburn too. And I was uh, hosted by, um, by Fred. Um, oh, and wow. so um, I'm blanking on his last name, Busquet, Fred Busquet. I was, I was um, hosted by Fred Busquet, but I ended up uh, choosing Florida. Um, wow, they must just, have done a bad uh, job. They put you with one of the world's greatest sprinters. Yeah, um, I don't, and you didn't I don't know why I chose it? Florida. I, honestly, I think they just, um, they were very welcoming. Uh, they paid for my entire trip out there. Um, so it was, uh, I, I love what I saw when I went there. Um, you know, the, the huge football team and the campus and everything. And 
Mm, I'm but yeah, have so, words. You know, I'll have to have words with David Marsh after this one. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, maybe it was the colors. I, I don't know, but I, I, I chose Florida. Fair enough. Um, I, I really had a good time there. Yeah, uh, I really yeah, did. My first yeah. year, I had a lot of fun, um, you know, swimming and, and learning about college and, and being in college. Um, it just, performance-wise, it just didn't work out. Um, I just wasn't swimming as fast as I wanted or needed, basically, to get back on the relay team. Um, and so I made a decision after two years to, uh, to, to transfer, to try something different. And uh, it ended up being a good decision in the end. Um, I ended up getting back on the South African Olympic team. And um, yeah, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed my time at the University of Arizona. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, um, and you had a lot of success in, in Arizona as well. And, and, you know, I have a theory on people that transfer, you either, you're either running away from your problems or you're taking your problems somewhere else. And generally speaking, and this is certainly a stereotype or a generality is that most people that transfer don't have success. Now you're one of those people that did. So how did you kind of break the curve on that one? How, how did you end up having success at Arizona? Well, I think the first thing was, and it, it's something I mentioned earlier was all of the people I worked with, um, you know, prior to, to college told me my best events were going to be in the two hundreds, yeah. you know, and I think for the first time when I got to Arizona, um, I, I was so tired of fighting the fight with people about that. I just decided, okay, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll, I'll concentrate on these two hundreds. I'll do the work for it. And, um, I'll open my mind to something, something different. And I immediately, maybe not immediately, but I definitely started to see some success there. And so I think that was, the big change I made um, in terms of the two reasons why, you know, you say your theory is why people transfer. I think I had both of those. Um, I think I ran away from problems in Florida and I think I took problems with me to Arizona. But sure. I think, I think the biggest thing for me was opening my mind to first of all, being coached. Um, mm. I think I was, I think growing up in South Africa, you do a lot of things on your own. I did all my own dry land in South Africa. I did my own weights in South Africa. I really had a large, part of uh, my swimming was me coaching myself. Um, mm. And I think um, I took that to Florida and I never really opened up to other ideas about technique, about training, about events. Uh, when I got to Arizona, I, I just decided for whatever reason it was, uh, I decided, okay, I'll, I'll let these coaches really coach me. I'll be the swimmer in the water. I'll listen to them. I'll do what they say. And, um, you know, I started to have success that way. And that's the key. And I'm so glad you said that because really that's the answer. And the answer is you really looked at yourself and you said, I've got to be coachable here. And, and ultimately that's what it comes down to. If you do want to transfer and if there's anyone out there listening to this, if you do want to transfer and, and if you are a transfer, the only way you're going to have success is to open yourself up to being coached, you know, and, and you did that and obviously you had success with it. Um, and, and Arizona, you had a lot of success too. You guys did really well there at the time, right? Yeah, it was, um, like I said, it was, it was a good decision for me and it, and it worked out. Um, yeah, we, we had some good success there. Individually, I had some great success with the few NCAA titles, but mm. uh, the relays really is, is where we had the major success. You know, we started winning relays, uh, quite a few of them at the NCAAs. And uh, then in 2008, my senior year, we ended up winning... Uh, NCAA team titles on both the men's and the women's side. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, um, yeah, it was, a, it was kind of Arizona's heyday in terms of, of championships. Um, but uh, really the, the coaching staff that Arizona had there, the, the team atmosphere was just something um, I'll never forget. Um, you know, I, I talk about, you know, college swimming with, with my swimmers, with people that ask me about college swimming, and I say by far, that the best four years of your swimming career will come in college. Um, you know, it's just so much fun being part of a team. And I think that's where college swimming differs from, from swimming in general, for, uh, no matter what level you're at, is you're part of a team in college. Um, and, and swimming is so individual, you know, leading up to that and, and potentially after that. But really in college is when swimming becomes a team sport and um, that's when you have the most fun. And so then you, f you finished college. What was it like to become a professional athlete at the time? Um, I know the professional setting has changed now, but, uh, you know, a few years back, 10 years ago, it was a lot tougher, right? Yeah, uh, obviously, um, 
you know, when you finish college, finances becomes a, a big part of, of the stressor. Uh, if you know you do want to continue swimming, um, obviously you have to finance yourself. I was lucky in that I was able to get some funding through South Africa to continue my swimming. Um, but yeah, that becomes a stressor when you don't have that. You, you have to find a part-time job. You're coaching on the side. You're doing private lessons. Um, so I, I was fortunate enough to be able to fund myself. I had some success in the World Cups. Uh, right after college and so obviously I used that money to to basically fund my way uh, through the next Olympic Games uh, I was able to pick up a few sponsors um, but it's and and you'll know this too is being an international student or being an international training in America is tough to locate sponsors uh, mm. American companies want to sponsor American athletes and so being an international or foreigner it, it does become tough to to pick up sponsors but you know, I was able to, uh, through A3 Performance, I was able to uh, basically fund my swimming um, and continue to have success. Um, I was also lucky in that Arizona did have a, a pro group at the time. Uh, you know, we were, there were a lot of us that wanted to continue swimming on past our NCAA eligibility. And um, it, I, we still were able to have that team atmosphere just with the pro group with Arizona. And so I think uh, that kept me swimming for, for much longer than I anticipated. Yeah. Well, you ended up making one of your biggest life decisions after that too. And, and I've become a U.S. citizen as well for various reasons. Um, but t talk us through the reason why you decided to become a U.S. citizen. And then ultimately, why did you decide to compete for the U.S.? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it was a hard decision. It, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, you know, being a, just like I said, it, it's hard being a, a foreigner, in the US trying, trying to find yourself and be a swimmer as a professional. Um, it was also for us, for me, um, it wasn't looked, it wasn't looked upon as fondly from the South African side either. Mm. Um, I feel like, you know, we didn't have a lot of support when it came from the coaches in South Africa. Um, and, and there was a lot of uh, internal fighting on some of the tours that we were on. Um, and so I felt like I was stuck between two countries. I, I wanted to represent South Africa as my, country of birth um but i also at at some point i wanted to represent the country that i saw my future in and the country that i'd grown to love um as a as a collegiate student and then also as a professional swimmer and so in 2014 i was eligible to to apply for citizenship and i did and at the time i i sat there thinking like okay what am i going to do here I, I can take citizenship but i can still represent south africa or you know who do i feel more uh, patri patriotic towards and when I answered that question for myself it, it was clear that the United States was the country I felt like I I belonged and I felt like I was part of the society here and so I made that decision in 2014 to switch my to switch my allegiance in terms of competing um, and I'm glad I did and I, I don't look back on it with any regret even though I didn't qualify for the 2016 Olympics um, I, I managed to do a couple tours with with the American team I uh, went to World Shore Course, I went to the, uh, the Pan, uh, Pan American Games, and then I also went down to Australia for a meet. Um, and so um, I learned a, a great deal from being part of that team. And uh, yeah, definitely no regrets in terms of that. Was it hard for you the first time to put the, the cap on? What, what kind of feeling was that for you? So yeah, that was, um, that was very, very interesting. My first time representing the u.s in a uh swim in a, in a swim event was the 4 by 100 free relay at the um world short course championships in dubai mm -hmm. um so that was an interesting story i had caps i was uh, sponsored by a3 performance at the time but my caps hadn't arrived in time for the for the race and so i lucky enough uh was able to borrow a cap from amy weitzel um and i i put that on for my race so there's actually a picture of me online somewhere, um, you know, with the Amy Whitesell cap on, uh, with the American flag. And so I had that. So, and this was all happening, like literally 20, 30 minutes before the race, um, getting this cap and getting everything that put on. And then to, to put the cherry on top of the cake, who do we, uh, get lined up right next to for my very first race was a uh, good old South Africa right oh. there next to us. Oh, wow. And I was actually with a guy, Leith Shankland, that, um, I grew up swimming with from Durban area where I grew up. Um, he was on some of the relays with me for South Africa and we're paired up against each other in our very first race. Wow. Um, yeah, I would say that's probably the most nervous I've ever been. Even in 2004, 
Uh, I think I was more nervous for this race. I swam awful. Um, I think someone who'd been 47.0 short course meters, I think I was like 48.5 or something like that. Oh, wow, yeah. Getting off a relay. Um, stopping on the walls, stopping on the blocks. I mean, it was just one thing after another just uh, wasn't good about that race. But um, it's something I look back now and I, I have a good laugh about it. But um, at the time, definitely uh, an interesting experience. Did you get some negative pushback from South Africa? Um, not a lot. Not a lot. Um, I mean, there were a few comments here and there. I'm not really one to um, go on social media and do a whole bunch with it. Uh, I think I use it nowadays because I have to. Um, and at the time, I wasn't someone always posting and reading comments and things like that. I mean, th there were a few comments that came my way, I guess. Um, but uh, nothing that really affected me. Yeah. Well, you, like you said, you did have success for, for the U.S. as well. You swam really well. And you ended up uh, – did you break a world record in some respects in, in an event? Yeah, I think we um... – I think we broke a world record in the morning of the short course world champs. I was part okay. of a relay. I, I can't remember which one, but yeah. then our team broke it at night. Okay. Um, so we only held it for a couple of hours. Um, okay. I wasn't able to swim in any uh, relays in the final. I was a prelim swimmer. Um, and so it was just in the prelims. And so I ended up getting a couple medals from that meet. I think we maybe got two from relays couple silvers um but i was always part of the prelims and not the finals yeah and so what was the decision like to hang it up in the end um yeah that was that was tough too um i still feel now like i could get back in the water and if i dedicated myself to to training and, and being a professional athlete i feel like i could do something I, I don't know if i could qualify for the next olympics but i feel like i could get back to close to where i i was in terms of my events and speed um so that that's always gnawing at me and and maybe that's why i'm still swimming masters and and still training and things like that um so that was tough but at the time it was tough too um i i wanted to i wanted to carry on swimming i just i think at some point life takes over and, and you realize that um no i need to start getting things in motion here um and so it, I, ultimately i think that was the decision why um you know to hang it up uh, but i think in the back of my mind i always knew i was going to some masters and so it was a little easier to know that hey i'm not just you know throwing my caps and goggles away i'm going to be using them i'm just not doing it on the professional side yeah did you transition into coaching immediately uh yeah pretty much um you know i was the club that i'm i'm, I'm coaching now um i, I swam for them the last couple of years leading up to the trials and I was doing some part-time coaching for them with, with the younger group. And so um, it just, timing is, is everything. And, and right about the, the time I was deciding to, to you know, uh, retire from professional swimming, uh, the job here became available and I was, I was able to get it. So I was just very lucky in, in being in the right place at the right time, I guess. Yeah. Do you, do you enjoy a particular age group, uh, you know, that you feel like you connect with really well? Yeah, I think, I think the age group I'm coaching now, um, anywhere from, from 14 years and then older, uh, I think I connect with them really well. Um, I, I love talking race strategy. Uh, for me, that, that was a big part of my swimming is, is learning how to race races different ways. Um, and so I, I love talking about that and, and really guiding my swimmers uh, um, and teaching them how to swim certain races. And I think the age is 14 and older get up a little bit better than some, maybe some of the younger kids. Yeah, cool, man. So where do you see your future in the next few years? Um, I, I mean, I, I love what I'm doing right now. Um, obviously, I love coaching and, and doing that right now uh, better. But, um, but uh, I, I feel like I'll just uh, doing what I'm doing right now. I, I don't really see any change. Um, I am starting to coach a little bit of college. Um, I was able to uh, be hired out as an assistant coach at Ottawa University, which is just up the road from where I live. They're actually using our swimming pool as their, their training base. Okay. So we're starting the, the swim program here in August. And so we're busy recruiting for that right now. Um, so I'm doing a bit of both. I'm, you know, I'm still going to remain in my job uh, full time with, with the, the YMCA Westside Silverfins as a head coach and coaching the, uh, the 14 to 18 year olds. But then I also get to get a little bit of experience coaching some college kids. And so I'm really looking forward to that. 
Awesome, man. Well, listen, any team would be very lucky to have you, obviously, with your with your knowledge and experience and just uh, your your temperament, too. It seems like you got the right temperament for it, which is good. Pretty level-headed. Awesome. I appreciate that, Brett. Thank you. Yeah, mate. Les, uh, I appreciate you coming on and just learning more about you. Um, obviously, incredible story, and it's uh, just kind of the beginning for you. How old are you now? Uh, 35. 35, okay. All right. Well, Anthony Irvin won the Olympics at 35. There's still time. <laughs> uh, and, and maybe there's still time to be a 50 freestyler if you want to do that you know? uh, i'm trying every day i, I wish <laughs> I, I try every day to become that but uh i don't know if it's in my dna <laughs> yeah maybe not I, I don't know i can't help you with it don't worry about it <laughs> um all right listen i appreciate you being on here man and uh take care and uh we'll stay in touch all right awesome thank you Brad. you can you stay well too all right darren take care bye all right cheers.